All right, we're going to go ahead and get started here. I hope everybody is having a great day. We got a little bit of snow here um, over the weekend, uh, but that is winter, right? So winter in the Midwest. Uh, I'm fighting a bit of a cold here. I'm on the tail end of that. So if you hear me sniffle or I sound like I'm a little bit stuffy, it's because I am sniffling and I am a little bit stuffy. So uh, today we're going to talk about the exciting topic of tax loss harvesting. And I'm really excited about this. Uh, if you Google tax loss harvesting, one of the bullet points that pop up are this is actually one of the most underutilized but most advantageous strategies in financial planning. So think about that. One of the most underutilized strategies. And it's because it's not talked about a lot. Right? It's not something that gets a lot of news, but it can be extremely beneficial uh, if used in the proper way. And we're going to talk about some of those today. Full disclaimer, right? I am not a CPA. Uh, I work uh, through financial planning. I have utilized these strategies hundreds and hundreds of times for clients, uh, but I am not a CPA. Uh, I will do my best to answer any questions, but for specifics and uh, something that would be necessary to actually put on a tax return. I'm going to give you the full disclaimer of talk to your CPA uh, regarding that. So with that being said, let's get started here talking about some tax loss harvesting. So just like I do every webinar, I'd like to get started just with our agenda, right, of looking through what do we have or what are we going to go through. So we're going to talk about what tax harvesting is. So I want you to have a very clear understanding of what it is. We're going to talk about the types of accounts that you can actually talk tax hawk, excuse me, tax loss harvest within. You can't tax loss harvest within every account. So we're going to talk about that, when you would want to do it and when you would not, and then how to actually perform the tax loss harvesting, and then some highlights of things to consider. And we'll have a couple of real life examples in there to really help wrap your mind around this. So once again, I have Jenna on the, the webinar here with us. Uh, I want this to be very interactive. So on the bottom, you're going to see a Q&A section. If you click that, if you have a question, just simply click the Q&A. You're able to type in any questions. We'll get a feed of those questions and we'll do our best to answer them either through the presentation and we'll have time at the end. We can also address any questions that you have as we go through. So first piece, right? What is tax loss harvesting? So in a nutshell, tax loss harvesting is utilizing underperforming, you know, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, whatever you hold, underperforming assets and using those losses to offset a higher performing asset or something with some form of gain. So in essence, using your losses to offset your gains and give you some preferential tax treatment. So as you can see on the chart to the right side of the screen, if you had a capital gain and you had a capital loss, those two will offset each other. Now, We'll talk about what types of gains and what types of losses can do this, but in essence, it's utilizing the volatility of the market or an underperforming asset to offset any gain that you had. So if you took a distribution, you're limiting your tax bill come the end of the year. Okay, that's in a nutshell. You can see on the bottom, one of the main pieces we're going to talk about as well is called a wash sale. So there's a rule that gets applied to this, which we'll talk on later, which is a wash sale provision. That's something a lot of people don't know about. So long story short, tax loss harvesting is utilizing losses against gains to reduce your tax bill and make it more efficient for you going forward. So there's a certain type of account that you can do this within, okay? So a 401k, IRA, Roth IRA, those are all what are called tax deferred accounts. This does not apply to those. So the only types of accounts that you can tax lost harvest within are what are called after-tax accounts. So that's money that you already paid taxes on. It's inside of an investment account. And I put a few different options here that you may be familiar with. So it might say an individual account. That would be an account with just your name on it. It might be a joint account, maybe with you and your spouse or a transfer on death account. It might be just an after-tax trust account, an account you have that's in the name of a trust. Those accounts, right, have what are called a cost basis. That's what you put into them. And then they track your gains or losses 
And anytime you were to sell something, that would trigger either a capital gain or a capital loss. So after tax accounts are the types of accounts that you can tax loss harvest within, not 401ks, IRAs, and Roth IRAs. And the reason for that being is inside of those qualified plans, everything grows tax deferred and there's no tax that's generated until you pull money out of the account. Right. So it doesn't matter what your basis was originally. Excuse me. It does matter. Right. We all want it to go higher, but it doesn't matter from a tax perspective what you bought it for and what you sold it for. But with an IRA or anything that's that's tax deferred, you pay taxes when you pull that money out. So um, we're talking strictly after tax investment accounts today as we go through this. So what I pulled on the right hand side is just a snapshot from an account, right? Obviously I can't give you any uh, account numbers, account names, et cetera, but this is something many of you might see when you looked at a login portal or you looked at a statement or you looked at a summary of accounts. And when you look at this page, there's a, a few takeaways that most clients when they look at it would look at. Number one, you can see there's unrealized gains here of about $290,000. You see there's some short-term losses of about $72. And then you see a breakdown, right? The total assets, any cash that they have, right? Equities inside the portfolio, how much are they up or down? Mutual funds inside the portfolio, how much are they up or down? So when you're looking at this breakdown, if you were just coming to me for the first time, you printed this out. The first thing I want you to be aware of is the term gains versus losses. So as you look through here, anytime you log into your online portal, anytime you log into your E-Trade account, whatever it is, or whatever you're logging into, typically they have your gains and losses tracked. And it's totaled under what's called net unrealized gains and losses. Okay, And you can see in this portfolio, there's 286,000 of net unrealized gains. What that means is there's 286,000 total of gains that have not had a trade placed against them to realize any taxation. That's why they call it unrealized. So the first factor you need to look at is just identifying what's truly your gain and what's truly your loss. And I have a few slides from now, we'll go through that much more in detail. The next piece that I'm gonna to touch on, which is extremely important, and if you're taking notes, please write this down, is a long-term capital gain versus a short-term capital gain. That next slide we go through, we'll go through that in detail. That's extremely important when you're doing any type of financial planning, long-term capital gain versus short-term capital gain. As I stated before, the next key piece to pay attention to is what's called a realized gain versus an unrealized gain. The easiest way to remember this, an unrealized gain is not taxed until it's realized. So I'm gonna repeat that. In this example, you can see there's 286 thousands of unrealized gains. That means that the assets have 286 thousand of gain attached to them from what the person purchased them at, but we haven't sold any of those assets yet to realize that gain. If this said realized, and not unrealized, this 286,000 would be fully taxable at the capital gains rate. So if it says realized, that means you have realized the gain and you will pay taxes. If it says unrealized, that means gains that are there, but they're not yet taxed. The other piece that you need to start looking at if you looked at this page, so if I'm looking at it with you, we're going to talk about what's the time horizon in which you see yourselves needing these assets. And the reason I say that is when do we need to start taking distributions? Is this money you're going to leave behind for your loved ones? All of that needs to get taken into account or consideration when you're talking through it. The last piece is do we have any upcoming need for the assets? Meaning, are you going to put a down payment on a house next year? Are you going to be buying a car? Do we have some unforeseen circumstance that we know is going to be coming up that we need to start planning for and set some money aside? All of that needs to be taken into account when you just look at this one page. 
Let's dive a little bit deeper into some of these details, and then I'll start bringing it full picture for us. In terms of understanding gains and losses, as I talked about before, long-term capital gains versus short-term capital gains have a huge difference on how your portfolio is taxed. So by definition, a long-term capital gain is a gain from an asset that you've held for more than one year and one day. So I'm gonna repeat that. A long-term capital gain is a gain from an asset, meaning let's say you bought Apple stock for $100 per share, you held it for two years, and now it's worth $150 per share. That $50 per share gain, right, would be taxed at what they call a long-term capital gain. And that's because you held that stock more than one year and one day before you sold it. And the reason I bring that up is there's preferential tax treatment for long-term capital gains for most investors, okay? And that's the key word, for most investors. So you can see from a preferential standpoint, right, there's a portion of investors out there that would pay a 0% capital gains rate. If you don't make enough income, you're going to pay a 0% capital gains rate. So, you know, as you look through here, that's really advantageous, right? We don't want to pay Uncle Sam more than we are due, right? We all have to pay our taxes, but we don't want to pay more than's necessary. And a portion of us on this call are in the 0% tax bracket. For married couple filing joint returns, right? If you're in that 83,000 threshold, up to the 517 threshold, you're in the 15% capital gains tax bracket. And remember, that's only on the growth or only on the gain inside the account. You're at 15%. And then the highest capital gains bracket would be 20%. So in that example that I shared before, right, if you had a hundred dollar per share Apple price and it grew to be 150, right, you're only taxed on that $50 per share gain. And depending on where you're at from an income filing standpoint, you'd pay anywhere from 15 to 20% tax on that gain. That's a long-term capital gain. Short-term capital gains, as you can see, are taxed at ordinary income. This becomes more disadvantageous for many of our investors because, you know, as you can see, you quickly jump above the 15% threshold. So, you know, if the average person, let's say on this call is making $100,000 a year, that would put that same capital gain, instead of being at a 15% rate, at a 22% rate. So a short-term capital gain, by definition, is an investment that you sold that you've held for less than one year and one day. So short-term is capital gain is taxed at ordinary income, long-term capital gain is taxed at a 15% to 20% rate. There's different circumstances where short-term can be more advantageous, but they're, they're very specific, right? If you're in a lower income bracket, you can see you can actually end up paying less if you're in a 10 or 12% bracket. But typically if you're in that lower bracket, you're in a 0% long-term capital gain range where you wouldn't have to pay anything as well. So there, there are some exclusions there, so as a rule of thumb, a long-term capital gain offset is offset by a long-term capital loss. So gains offset losses, losses offset gains. So if you have a long-term capital loss, you can offset a long-term capital gain. Same thing with short-term. If you have a short-term capital gain, you can offset a short-term capital loss. It's not the same for a short-term gain and a long-term loss, right? Short-term loss offsets a short-term gain. Long-term loss, loss offsets a long-term gain. So just be aware of that as you work through. Let's look at a, a real-life example here as we're talking through. So I'm going to take into account, and let's just say this is a short-term capital gain. Okay, so if you purchased an investment, all right, you purchased $100,000 into Apple, and that $100,000 uh, grew to $120,000, and you called and said, you know what, we need to take a distribution to purchase a new car. If you did that, you would have 
a $20,000 gain. So think about it. You started with 100,000. That investment grew to be 120,000. And ultimately that realized a gain of $20,000 inside that account. So if we don't look at investment B and we just look at investment A and you held that asset for less than one year and one day, depending on where your income level is at, you would pay ordinary income. So in this example, let's say Mr. Smith, who owned this investment, was in a 35% tax bracket. So if you had $20,000 of gain, you put in $100,000 into Apple, it grew to be $120,000. That's a $20,000 gain from what you put in. You liquidated that. That would trigger your $20,000 gain times the short-term capital gains rate of 35%, right? Because that would be the ordinary income level in this example, which means on that $20,000 gain, you owe Uncle Sam $7,000. That's not very fun. And that's what a lot of investors do right there because they don't look at the overall pie. So for example, last year was extremely volatile in the markets. I think we can all agree with that, right? The S&P ended the year down about 18.21% from where it started at the beginning of 2022. We saw all kinds of ups and downs in the market. If you sit down with a client, and you're sitting there and you're looking, or you, in your example, if you sit down with an advisor and you're looking at the full scope of things, one option to offset that taxation is to look and see if there's any losses in the portfolio that you can also sell to offset that gain. So in this example, let's say Mr. Smith has investment B and has a total of about $25,000 of losses from a different investment that he made. Let's say he owned some Tesla. Let's say he owned some Facebook. Both of those underperformed last year. And let's say he has $25,000 of losses that we could harvest from those other two investments. So since this is also a short-term capital loss versus a short-term capital gain, it's the same exact math. This 20,000, so 20,000 of the 25 can immediately go to offset the $20,000 of capital gain. So if you had 20,000 of gain in Apple, you had $20,000 of loss in Tesla, and they're both capital, short-term capital gain, short-term capital loss, they immediately offset or wipe each other out. So you can see the $7,000 worth of taxes that would have been owed is now $7,000 of taxes that are immediately saved. It wipes it out dollar for dollar. In addition to that, if you go above the threshold, the IRS caps it at $3,000. You can claim up to $3,000 per year to help reduce your ordinary income level. So in this example, if we harvested $25,000 worth of capital losses, we only needed to offset $20,000 of capital gains. So we're able to do that dollar for dollar. We just saved the client or Mr. Smith in this example, $7,000 he would have owed to Uncle Sam. And he's able to take the additional $5,000 that we have not yet utilized. And 3,000 of that can help reduce his tax burden. So remember, he's in a 35% tax bracket. So if we do the math on that, $3,000 that he's able to take as a deduction against his income saves him an additional $1,050 in taxes. That's a lot. In addition to that, he also can carry forward up to $3,000 of capital loss each year until it's used up. So in this example, 20,000 went to offset the gain. 3,000 is the cap for reducing the ordinary income level. And the remaining $2,000 can be carried forward and used next year for tax planning purposes. So if we total that up, that's an $8,050 tax savings just by utilizing some of the losses in the portfolio. Now, I know many of you are thinking, well, over the years we've been trained don't touch it, don't pay attention to it, think long-term, okay? 
Absolutely, that is very accurate and very timely advice most of the time, right? Most of the time. The reason I say most of the time is you don't want to sell a good investment just because. If you believe that company is going to come back and you believe in that company and there's a purpose behind holding that investment, you don't want to sell it just to sell it. But if there's an... um if there's different triggering events that you're aware of that are going to be coming up, then absolutely you want to start looking at some of these strategies. So for example, let's say that Mr. Smith needed $20,000 or needed $40,000 to purchase a new car. If he knew he needed to purchase a new car next year and had the ability at the end of last year with all the volatility, to take a $40,000 distribution from the portfolio and save upwards of $8,050 in taxes compared to just selling you know, his $20,000 gain, who wouldn't want to do that, right? So all you're doing is using the volatility to your advantage. And you're saying, hey, I know that I have some gains. I know hey, I have some losses. How can I make these two offset to reduce my tax burden and also give me the ability to take distributions without having to pay Uncle Sam a bunch of money. So I use this example all the time when I'm talking about uh, clients between taking a distribution from an IRA and taking a distribution from an after-tax account. So for example, if we look at this portfolio, you can see it's a lot of different stocks. And many of you I'm sure are squinting because I'm squinting and sitting a lot closer than I should be to the computer to read all this. But what I want you to pay attention to on here is this section right here that says unrealized gains and losses. And you can see this client has held the account for quite some time and it's done very, very well over the years. You see there's over 336,000 of unrealized gains. So remember when you see the term unrealized, that means that there's 336,000 of gains that have accumulated inside the account. Okay, that's very good. They have not yet been realized because we haven't sold any of the assets. That's very important. This unrealized gains, especially as you get older, becomes very important. The reason I say that is many clients that come to us might have be holding stock that they've held for 20, 30, you know, sometimes even 40 years while they worked with a company. They might have some unrealized gains inside their portfolio, you know, and I've seen clients with seven figures of unrealized gains because they've gone through stock splits and things like that over that time period. Well, if they're never going to touch that money and they're comfortable holding that asset in their older, right? and you're in your later innings of life, when you pass away, there's what's called a stepped up cost basis. And there'd be no taxes incurred when your family inherits that in most circumstances. That's something to take into account as these continue to get larger. The other piece to look at, and the reason I bring this up as an example is this is a true life example. I'll call her Mary. Mary came to me, single woman, worked really hard, very successful in her career. Mary came, we sat down, she wanted to do some uh, gifting to her daughter to help her, per her help her daughter purchase a home in another state. So she sat down, she said, Tyler, we need to come up with a way that I can gift over a period of time, approximately $100,000 to my daughter because she wants to purchase a home in another state. I said, okay, let's, let's take a look. And she said, I've been doing this for a while. And she pulled this up and she said, I'm going to get absolutely crushed in taxes. And I looked at her and I said, you know, Mary, this is your, your slush account. This is your assets that you set aside that we're going to have grow for a long period of time. We're holding really good investments in here. But I, there's some different ways for you to get distributions without getting crushed. And she was just taken aback because she didn't even know how to think about that. So here she needed $100,000. When she opens up her you know, login or her statements, she sees that there's $336,000 of gain on that account. And her first blink is, if I take a distribution, I've held these for more than one year and one day, 
and she makes good income, she's going to pay a 20% capital gain plus state tax plus, you know, the Obamacare tax, which is 3.8. So she's going to pay about 28% tax on any of the gain. And I said to her, Mary, this is money that is your slush fund. We're going to continue to hold and we want to be very effective and efficient when we dive through here. So what I want you guys to look at is if you look at the unrealized gains and losses tab right here, and as you slide down through, you're going to notice the reason you diversify inside of accounts is not everything goes up or down at the same time, and not everything goes up or down at the same pace. So you're going to see some holdings only have a $513 gain, other holdings have an $18,000 gain, $22,000 gain. Oh, there's a loss, right? We continue to go down through. Oh, there's a loss. There's a loss, right? So of the 24 holdings that Mary has, three of those holdings have a capital loss. Now, I want you to think in your head, Mary needs $100,000. This is money she doesn't plan on ever spending unless she wants to grab it and has a purpose behind it. Does she want to pay Uncle Sam more than she needs to for money she doesn't ever really plan on using other than gifting to her kids at a stepped up cost basis later? No. So she needs $100,000. As you look through here, what we're able to do is we could harvest two of her holdings at a $20,000 total capital loss long term, which would free up a loan almost $80,000 in itself, but we don't have to harvest all of it, right? Why use all your powder if you don't need to, especially if it's a good long-term investment? So in this example, what we would look at is we would say, of the holdings that she has, we could look at Gilead Sciences here, and there's a $73,000 gain. If we wanted to trim some of that position, we could sell 3M and realize a $10,000 loss, which would free up $38,000 for Mary to take as a distribution. And we could sell a portion of Gilead Sciences that would allow her to be able to take the $100,000 distribution, but completely offset the tax from one another. So what you're doing is if someone or if you need a distribution, don't stay surface level. Don't stay up here and say, hey, we're going to have a bunch of taxes that we're going to incur. No, dive down through and look deeper. And you can be very exclusive on how and when you take distributions to free up the cash flow that's necessary so you don't have to pay Uncle Sam more than it's due. So for Mary's example, I screenshotted this at the end of last year, knowing we were going to do this presentation. What we did is I freed up some distributions from 3M and Verizon to realize some of the long-term capital loss. And then I went through and I realized some of the gains to offset the difference. And I got her a $100,000 distribution and she didn't have to pay any capital gains, which is exactly what she was looking for. And the rest of the assets can continue to perform and continue to grow. That's an example of how this can be used and how it can save an immense amount of tax. If Mary just clicked the button, to sell $100,000, what they would have done is they would have sold or sold fractional shares of all 24 holdings. And they would have used what's called first in, first out. And that means all of the gain is going to be taxed first, right, before you're going to get to the basis. So as we look at the holding that's there, if we said $100,000 of gain would have been realized at a 28.5% tax bracket, that's $28,000 in Uncle Sam payment she would have had to make that she did not have to make because she tax lost harvested. That's a really good positive. The second piece that I want to look at off this slide is certain clients that are on this call, and some people maybe that I've never talked to that are on this call, might be holding too much in one company. And we run into this a lot. You know, whether you're working for Abbott, AbbVie, I work with a lot of those retirees that hold 90% in one company, whether you're with Baxter, whether you're with any of these large Fortune 500 companies that have done very, very well, right? There is a risk when you hold too much in one company, right? An Enron type situation. 
I'm not saying that's the case. I'm not saying that you need to lose sleep over that at all. But as your nest egg continues to build and the lion's share of your portfolio might be in one company, a great way to start diversifying outside of that company is through tax loss harvesting. So for example, let's say that you had you know, $300,000 of Abbott and you've held it forever and you acquired or your cost basis on that 300,000 is $100,000. So let's say you put 100,000 into Abbott and now it's grown and it's worth 300,000. So you have $200,000 of long-term capital gain inside of that one holding. And let's say that that's the lion's share of your portfolio and you just saying, you know what, it's too much in Abbott, but I, I just don't wanna pay the tax man uh, it, to realize that gain. Well, similar example, if you have other holdings that are, that are at a long-term capital loss, you can liquidate those holdings and then offset that loss against the gain in Abbott in that example. And what that allows you to do is over the years, you can slowly start to piece out of that just one holding and diversify into other similar investments just to get you some more safety without incurring large tax penalties, right? And that's the biggest piece is we wanna save on the tax dollars if we can. So that's another prime example of where tax loss harvesting can be extremely efficient is saying, I've got too much in this one account. I've got some substantial capital gains that have accrued over the years. How do we offset those? Look at the rest of your portfolio and find something that's underperformed that you can sell at a loss to offset against some of the gains. And if you do that each year, you're able to diminish any of that tax impact you would have and then start to spread out that diversification so you're not having all your eggs in one basket per se. So remember, as we're going through here, if you have specific questions, please click on those uh, as we dive through because I'm happy to go through them in detail. So some things to consider you know, as you're going through any type of tax loss harvesting. There's what's called a wash sale provision. This is where people get themselves in trouble. So in the last, I would say, two years in particular, I have seen this more so than ever. And the only thing I can attribute it to is that when we're on the internet or watching TV, day trading has become more and more popular. For example, I talked with a, uh, an individual that needed some help. They called in and they were just frantic. And this was right before last year during tax season. And they came in and they, they were doing those meme stocks. Uh, so like AMC stock and some of these popular internet uh, stocks, they were day trading them and they were purchasing into them and they made a substantial amount of money on the upside. They timed it really well and had gains in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. They were also then doing trades on the downside and they thought they were offsetting the taxes because they bought on a gain, they bought on a low and basically thought they were offsetting all the way through. They made a couple bad bets. And at the end of the day, their gain was only about $10,000. So think about that. They started with an amount, they made hundreds of thousands of dollars. That stock came back down. Instead of selling out at a high, they wrote it down and they only made a gain of about $10,000 total, okay? So a $10,000 gain on paper. When they started doing their sales, because they were day trading, they were buying in and buying out all the time, they started to get hit with, with what was called a wash sale provision. So what a wash sale means is you, can, you have to own the company that you're going to be placing a trade for more than 30 days prior to the sale, so let's say that you own XYZ company, right? Let's say you bought it six months ago. Well, if you bought it six months ago and you sell it today, you've got that box checked. You've owned it for more than 30 days. And that means that if you place a trade today, in order for you to realize that capital loss on your tax documents, you cannot buy XYZ back inside that account for another 30 days. So you have to wait till the 31st day and then you purchase it back. Do day traders pay attention to that? No. What they're doing typically is they're 
buying and selling. And then a week later, they might find something, they buy it and sell it. And they do it again and again and again. And all of a sudden they're realizing gains, but they're not able to offset the loss. And it, it incurs a very, very large tax bill at the end of the year. So pay attention if you're going to be doing this yourself. This is where experts come in. The wash sale provision. If you sell out of XYZ company, you cannot purchase back into XYZ company for at least 31 days in order to claim the loss. I've had clients where they say, you know what, I want to sell out of this holding, but I really like that company. It's just down and I want to realize the loss. I say that's perfectly fine, but we can't buy back into it for 31 days. And that's a really good strategy to look at because you can reset your cost basis and there's some huge advantages with that. But one thing to pay attention to is you have to wait 31 days to get back into it. That's called a wash sale. Okay, So if you sell a company on the 31st day, that's the first day you could buy it back. Short-term appreciation of the assets. This is a risk. So if you do the strategy I just talked about, let's say you, you have a huge appreciation of AbbVie, bought it for $100,000, it's worth $500,000. You like AbbVie, but you know that your cost basis was way down here and you're saying, how do I get it way up here? How do I step up my cost basis while I'm alive? A way to do that is you could do it through tax loss harvesting. If you have something at a loss, you can sell it and you could sell some of your AbbVie at a gain and you could wait 31 days and then purchase the AbbVie back. You're past the wash sale provision. And if you're buying it back at a larger price, you're now a new basis is higher, right? So if you bought it at $100 per share, held it for 30, you know, held it for two years, held it for five years, whatever it is, you sold it at $150 per share and you waited 31 days and, and bought back into it at let's say 149 a share, your new cost basis is 149, not 100, right? So there's some advantages behind that. The risk that you run is you're out of the market in that example for 31 days. So what most people do as a strategy is they'll sell out of a company to realize the tax loss or the tax gain, and then they'll buy a comparable stock in a similar sector, right? What they're doing is they're saying, we're hedging the risk and we're allowing ourselves to stay inside the market. And we can always get back into this other company in the future, but you're taking advantage of the tax uh, code to allow you to get the deductions in place. So. A few examples on how this can benefit or how tax loss harvesting can benefit individuals. Number one, it allows you to be selective in offset gains you've had over the years with losses. Last year was a primary example of how volatile the market can be. And remember, we've been on a bull run in the market for about the last seven to 10 years. So the last five years in particular, many portfolios have had substantial gain and clients have not taken gains off the table. So in order to take those off the table, if you had some losses uh, that can be offset over the last 12 month period, what an opportunity to look at getting some of those gains off the table without incurring a lot of tax. That's number one. Number two, if you have a distribution that's coming up and you know there's going to be an, an expense that's incurred, look at your gains, offset them against your losses, see how much money you could take out without having to pay Uncle Sam a bunch of money. That's number two. Number three, having the ability to diminish a very, very large holding in your portfolio strategically. You know, if you're holding 90% of your portfolio in one company, you said that's too much, but I don't want to pay Uncle Sam, utilize some of those losses against that gain of the portfolio to start reallocating those funds into other assets to diminish the risk. And then the last one is ultimately stepping up the cost basis. But in order to do that and buy the same company, remember, you got to hold it, uh, stay out of that company for at least 31 days so you don't fall into the wash sale provision. Um, I'm going to leave this open now to questions. I saw that there was one individual that raised their hands. There was a couple other questions that had come through. Jenna, I'm going to ask you to jump back on here and help facilitate that uh, before we close this out. I actually uh, answered the question that had come through. And if someone raised their hand, if they could re-raise that, that would be amazing. However, oh, here we go. I'm going to allow, 
this attendee to talk. Oh, uh, Lazaro, can you hear me? Can you hear us? Lazaro, if you can hear us, you're muted uh, and you have the ability to share here if you'd like to. And that's okay. That's okay. okay look yeah. like they're, looks like we're having some technical difficulties there. Oh, Lazaro, you there? Yes, I'm here. I saw you had your hand raised. How can I help you, Lazaro? Oh, I apologize. That was my mistake. I said, I'm listening here while I'm driving. I went to look at the screen and I went back to I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. okay. That's absolutely that's fine. fine. Absolutely fine. I appreciate you listening and drive safely. The So as we look through... Uh, one big question that we get all the time from clients is when do we do this and, and how do we approach this? Okay. And I can see there's another question coming through on the bottom that's comparable to this. So I'm just going to re-paraphrase the question here. So uh, a great time to look at this is year end in particular, or if you see big periods of volatility that are incurred, right? So if you see the market drop drastically, that triggers an opportunity to say, okay, do we want to do some tax loss harvesting to be strategic? The risk you run, though, is if you don't stay invested in the market, that short-term appreciation on the upside can be risky. The most common time that we see this is the fourth quarter, right? Because the finish line for the year is right there. And if you want to realize any gains or losses, you have to do it before December 31st. So it's really looking at that saying, hey, we've got an end line here in play. Throughout the year, the most common way, and if you're taking notes, write this down, the best way to do it is if you want to realize some gains, realize the gains throughout the year. And then when you get towards the end of the year, you start realizing the losses to offset the gains you had. So if the market goes way up, take some gains off the table. You're just hedging your risk, right? Take the gains off the table throughout the year. Keep a cumulative total of what those realized gains are. Remember, realized means that's what you're going to be taxed on. And when you get towards the end of the year, then we start looking at the losses saying, how do we offset those gains so you don't owe the tax man more than you need to, All right? We just got another question in. What about the person that you gift the 100,000 to? So your gift, that's a great question. So I didn't even finish my story, so thank you. Uh, so we were able to gift the 100,000 to Mary's daughter in that example. Um, so the, the gift as a whole, the IRS allows you to gift up to $17,000 per person per year uh, without you know, being reported or any type of uh, negative impact that comes from that. In this example, what Mary did is she did what's called a one-time gift exclusion. So her daughter needed $100,000 for the down payment on a home. Um, Mary was able to sell some of her holdings at a loss and some at a gain receive this $100,000 with no tax impact because the gains offset by the losses, right? So this 100,000 was in her checking account. She gifted that directly to her daughter and she had to work with her CPA to fill out a one-time gift exemption form and she was good to go. So no taxes impacted whatsoever by the person receiving those assets. Really good question. Yeah, if you gifted stock or something like that with a gain attached to it, then when that person that received the stock sold the stock, they would pay the gain. But in this example, it was already washed out because of the tax lost harvesting. And uh, she was able to gift you know, with no tax penalties at all. Really good That's question. Good insight. Does anyone have any further questions before we end the webinar? And I don't see anything coming through here. So we, we oh, recorded okay. this. I know that many of these concepts are um, can get complicated. And there's so many what ifs that come off of this. If you do have questions, please feel free to reach out to us. Uh, we did have two participants raise their hand here, Jenna Quick, too, that we could take possibly a question from. But um, if you do have specific questions that you'd like to go through, by all means, please reach out to myself or our advisors as we're happy to go through those with you to, to find out a plan to see what makes sense, if it makes sense, et cetera. So with that being said, uh, we'll end it here for tonight. I hope all of you have a fantastic night and uh, thanks for taking the time to listen to the webinar.